All right. Well, uh, welcome back to those of you who were with us last week or watched on the uh, YouTube recording. And uh, welcome to all of our newbies today as we uh, talk about the divine call, uh, the blessings and challenges that come with it, uh, lay leaders working together with called workers to make ministry happen. And uh, we're going to talk about the, the ins and outs of, of gospel ministry and, and uh, how we issue divine calls and how we view them, how we use them. So um, let's get started with prayer, shall we? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So uh, just a, a very brief recap of what we talked about last time. Um, the, uh, back in 2021, the Synod encouraged Bible studies and articles to be published so that more congregations are familiar with the, the call system in our church body. Um, not only the, the process, but also the, the, the doctrine of the divine call, because this is not just something that is a man-made invention, but this is something that is taught in Scripture. Um, so we just kind of had, you know, our, our main questions that we're going to look at. What is gospel ministry? How does someone become a public minister? Uh, how does the Wells call process work? How does someone decide whether to accept or decline a call? What are things to remember when serving in a call? And what are the blessings for the called worker and for those who are served by the called worker? Okay. We also talked about uh, the difference between the, the, pre the universal priesthood of all believers, which is the fact that all of us as Christians, we, are, we have the responsibility of sharing the gospel with other people in our lives. Um, but while we all share that responsibility of being universal priests, uh, there are a select few that share in the public ministry of the gospel. In other words, that is what they do for a living. That is their full-time job. Um, again, the universal priesthood of all believers. It's all believers having access to God. And so we all declare God's praises. We all share the gospel. We all have this task to go and make disciples. Uh, we spent uh, a good chunk of time talking about what the public ministry is. Uh, it's the administration of the means of grace on behalf of and in the name of Christ and on behalf of other Christians. Uh, we have folks who do it um, in a representative way for the, the, the gathering of Christians. Um, it's God who is the one he, he, he calls people into the public ministry. So again, this isn't, this is more than just, you know, hiring and firing type of thing. God himself makes this happen. Um Again, God calls people to the public ministry. This isn't something that people take upon themselves and say, I'm going to be a pastor, I'm going to be a teacher, and I'm going to start my own ministry. That's not really how it works. Um, God is the one who appoints people and, and, and motivates and moves people to pursue uh, public ministry. Um, God alone gives someone the right and the privilege to serve in the public ministry. As it says in our Lutheran confessions from the, the Augsburg Confession, no one should teach publicly in the church or administer the sacraments unless properly called. Um, scripture teaches that God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. And so God wants his ministry to be done in an organized and efficient way. So those are the things that we talked about uh, last time. So let's pick up uh, where we left off, continuing our discussion about what exactly is the public ministry. Um, God alone gives the message. You know, Paul, Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 2, when I, Paul, when I came to you, uh, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So again, we're not preaching our own message. We're not teaching our own opinions. We are teaching God's message. Um, and that ought to be the, the focal point around everything that we do um, at, at, in the public ministry. So God establishes the public ministry. This is something that God gives. It's his gift to us so that people would come to know Jesus as their one and only Savior. But with that being said, even though God is the one who has established 
the public ministry, he does allow for some flexibility for how the ministry happens while we are on earth. So he allows his church to define the function and the scope of the ministry. You know, so in other words, local congregations, the, the church here on earth, gets to decide, you know, who's going to serve in what capacity, um, such as pastor, administrator, principal, teacher, staff, ministers. Those are the ones that are, are most common to us in our church body. But, of course, there are other uh, positions within the, the public ministry in which, into which someone can be called, such as deacon or um, uh, presbyter or or whatever. Um, but again, these are the ones that we are most familiar with. Pastor, administrator, principal, teacher, staff, minister. But the church is the one who, who uh, gets to decide um, how that ministry is going to work and function. Um, Full-time ministers. So uh, let's see. We've got to look at my notes. Where are we at here? Um, the pastor. The pastoral ministry, by far, is is the most um, the the widest scope of ministry. Um, you know, because with with teachers and and staff ministers, you know, their their job is very specific to teach this specific group of people the, this uh, you know the, the things that they need to know. And, and I mean, that's what they're responsible for. A pastor kind of can oversee a, a whole lot. So it's up to the congregation to define that and to, to call full-time public ministers into their, their ministry. Um, but not only can a church call full-time public ministers, but also part-time public ministers as well, such as, you know, uh, pastors who are retired, they can be called back into the public ministry on a part-time basis. Um, to, to maybe serve a, a vacancy while a congregation is calling for a full-time pastor. Um, otherwise, there's also the position of vacancy pastor. When I was serving in Tacoma, Washington, I had the privilege of assisting with the vacancy. Uh, my associate was really the, 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 the main vacancy pastor because our, our sister congregation on the other side of town, they were without a pastor for about a full year. And so since we were the closest Wells Church and there were two of us at that congregation, it, it made sense that they would call the more experienced man to, to handle that, that vacancy. And then I would pick up the slack at, at our congregation. But I did have the privilege of assisting the, every now and again with preaching and uh, um, doing other things uh, in that vacancy. So um, congregations also... Uh, can decide how formal or informal uh, or the occasional public ministers, you know, um, such as, you know, does the church want to call Sunday school teachers, elders that assist with communion? Of course, we certainly do that here at St. Paul. So our Sunday school teachers are more than just volunteers. They are called because they are participating and assisting in the administration of the means of grace, in which God's word is certainly a part of that. So they're, they're more than just volunteers. They are called uh, into the public ministry. And um, elders, you know, elders who, who assist with the administration of the sacraments, who, who visit me members and, and calls them and, and helps them in their spiritual life, um, elders are also called into the public ministry. More, more so on a volunteer basis, but nonetheless, they are part of this public ministry. Um, question for you. Question number one, I believe, on your uh, study guides, if you got those. So if the pastor's office is the broadest scope, and, and it really is, okay? The, the pastoral ministry is the broadest, the broadest scope since the pastor is called to be a shepherd of the entire flock. Whereas teachers and staff ministers are not. They have a very specific group and a very specific focus. Um, you know, the church is also able to establish, you know, specialized ministries such as, you know, synod, uh, synod officers, synod presidents, school presidents, administrators. Um, something else, I guess, before before we get to answering number one, I just want to make a note of this. Uh, you know, so a lot of people ask, well, what's the difference between Wells and, and Missouri Synod? Well, one of the main, one of the big differences between Wisconsin Synod and Missouri Synod is the fact that 
uh, the Missouri Synod teaches that only the specific office of the pastor is one that God has established and that everything else, you know, teachers, staff, ministers, deacons, or whatever, um, those are all auxiliary to the, the office of the pastor. Uh, we and Wells say, no, that's not true. The, the public ministry uh, is entrusted to all who are assisting in that. So pastors, as well as teachers and staff ministers, and however else you define your scope of ministry, Sunday school teachers, elders, they are part of the public ministry in which God uh, has called them into. All right. So with that being said, if the pastor's office is the broadest in scope, does that mean that other offices are less divine or are less important? Why or why not? So be prepared to defend your answer. If the pastor kind of oversees more than any other office of the public ministry, does that make his office more or less divine than the other offices? Go ahead, Marion. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So I, I, I love what you said there, that our, our jobs may look different and how we carry that out may look different. But in essence, isn't the job very much the same to preach the gospel, to administer the means of grace for the, the benefit and the strengthening of souls? So in that instance, yeah, we, we're all on the same playing field. And I would agree with you 100 percent on that. Anybody else want to add to that? What's that? Amen. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it, it's kind of interesting to see how, you know, the, the pastor, you know, they, they're they not more important than the teacher or the staff minister or anyone else. But but at the same time, you, you, you cannot ha you cannot have a, a functioning congregation without a pastor, you know. Um, you could have a congregation without teachers, but you can't have a congregation without a pastor. And yet at the same time, um, the pastor is not to be this, you know, higher elevated position of public ministry. Um, we are definitely co-workers working together just that our scope, our responsibility, the way we carry out our administration of the means of grace is different. And that's just fine. Okay. Just a side note on that. But you are a pastor too. Mm -hmm. so yeah. In that respect, I'm not your teacher. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. You are my pastor. Yeah. Yeah. So it, this really is a very unique uh, setup, if you will, a very unique dynamic. In that, yes, we are coworkers. We are equal. Um, I'm not more important than you are, but at the same time, you're not my teacher, but I am your pastor. That. Yeah. That's. It's very interesting how this all works out, isn't it? Very interesting. And 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 you folks who are uh, joining us on the Zoom call, please feel free to, to chime in. We'll we'll all be able to hear you just fine. So, all right. I'd like to mention something on that. Please go ahead. Uh, I, what comes to mind there is uh, we're all one body, many different parts, but no part is greater than any other part, and we all need to work together. Yes, absolutely, 100%. It, this is what the, the body of Christ is all about. With what It's one whole body, one whole unit, but we all bring something different to the table. And as long as we are using our gifts and abilities to, to further the course of the gospel throughout the world, that's what makes the body of Christ work, and it's a beautiful thing. So thank you for that comment. I'm assuming that was Bob talking. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, let's move on. The public ministry of the gospel. So here we, we see that God establishes uh, personal qualifications. Um, and, and this is listed in uh, 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 10. Uh, you guys at home, are you able to see 1 Timothy 3? Yes. All right, good, good. So... Um, I would ask if someone, either here in the fellowship hall or at home, uh, if someone could uh, 
as you can tell, my voice is not quite at 100. percent So, I, if, if one if one of you guys would be willing to read First uh, Timothy three verses one through uh, uh, well these the, these verses from First Timothy chapter three, that would be uh, greatly appreciated. Go ahead, Ken. Thank you. Now the overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectful, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money, and must manage his own family well. Okay, thank you. And and, and it, it goes on, it, it goes on further, but uh, we'll we'll just sum it up for, for there for now. Okay. Um let, let let's break it down a little bit. Uh here we see that God, he's emphasizing how important this job is, you know, by listing qualifications. All right, you must meet these standards if you want to serve in the public ministry, okay? Um, and he does that because th this is important work. You know, not just anyone can come in and do the work of a public minister, whether it be a pastor, teacher, staff minister, what have you. So, you know, these are the qualifications that, that God demands for those who want to serve in the public ministry. First off, says that uh, the overseer must be above reproach. So in other words, called workers should be careful not to act or speak in a way in which others could easily condemn them uh, and their actions and, and, and thus take away from their effectiveness in teaching the word of God. So uh, in other words, we, we as ministers, as called workers, we have to practice what we teach. Uh, as best as we are able. Granted, we're not going to do it perfectly, but uh, we, we we try our best to do so. Uh, the husband of but one wife. Um, God tells all of us uh, that marriage is to be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure. And this is especially the case for called workers. They should not be doing anything in their marriage which would bring shame to their ministry and, and really discredits uh, what they teach and preach. And this is this is why all of these qualifications are here. It's it's so that the 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 public minister, um, you know, is not hindered or, or or their way of life is not hindering their message, so that people can take them and their message seriously. Uh, temperate and self controlled called workers need to guard against excesses in behavior and speech. So they need to be careful about what they do, what they say so as to not drive people away from their message and ministry. So as a minister, if we were to say, do as I say, but not as I do, well, who's going to take you seriously? You've just lost all your credibility. Uh, respectable. People should be able to look at called workers and recognize that they are worthy of honor and respect. Um, actions by a called worker that cause people to lose respect for them damage not just them and, and their reputation, but also their ministry. Doesn't mean that called workers can't have fun, you know, and, and have fun with the people that they serve, but uh, it just all has to be done within reason. Uh, hospitable, called workers need to be friendly and welcoming to those they know and to those they don't know. Um, you think about the example that Jesus set for us, uh, where he, he was willing to associate with anyone from any walk of life. Didn't matter whether they were high class or, you know, the, the most poorest person or the societal reject. Uh, Jesus was hospitable and welcoming to all. Uh, one must be able to teach because serving in the ministry requires more than just knowledge. Uh, because a lot of people, you know, can know a whole bunch of facts about the Bible, but if they're not able to to teach it or communicate it so that other people can learn and grow, um, then that hinders their their uh, uh, ministry. Not given to drunkenness. So self-control when it comes to use of alcohol is vital because we know that an, an excess of alcohol impairs one's judgments. And um, that certainly has a negative effect on their ministry and their reputation as well. Not violent, but gentle. So called workers should never resort to bullying or threats, but rather they should be kind, winsome, and persuasive. And I've heard of, of ministers who have used the pulpit as their own personal platform to get things off their chest or you know, have used it as a, a 
bully pulpit and call people out, uh, that is never okay. Never, ever okay. Um, not violent, but, uh, oh, wait, we already did that one. Uh, not a lover of money. So called workers will remember that they are not in the ministry to become rich. Uh, they also should not set a poor example by complaining or worrying about their money. Um, God gives us our daily bread every single day. He will continue to provide for us. And so uh, unless, unless you know, the, uh, the congregation is like massively underpaying you or maybe they're not paying you at all, which has happened before, um, unless those extreme cases are happening, uh, the, 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 the public minister is to be content with what they have and that they will trust that God will provide for them. Um, they must manage their own family well. No called worker will be a perfect parent, obviously, and I'm probably a living example of that. But they do need to strive to bring up their children with proper discipline because, well, if you can't manage your own your own home, how are you going to manage God's family or the family that you've been called to serve? So uh, let's get to our, our next question. Number two, God has set some high standards for those who serve in the public ministry. Why? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, if you're going to if you're going to carry out your ministry on a do as I say, not as I do basis, no one will take you seriously. And no one will no one will have a, a, a an understanding or appreciation for the hope that you have. And by doing so, you're also uh, you're more apt to lead people astray. Ken. You can use some other words of shame and discredit and credibility. Mm -hmm. All of those things tied into that. Right. Yeah. Are we believe with what we're saying? We need to live. Yes. Absolutely, 100% correct. Uh, let, let's keep in mind what, what the, the goal is. You know, God is using us to bring people to Jesus so that they can enjoy eternal life in heaven. So, yeah, we, we have to be very careful that we are not doing anything to bring dishonor to the gospel ministry. Anything else? If you live these life, if you live your life with these qualities, you're going to be more believable. Yep, absolutely. You're, yeah, if, if you take, if you if you practice what you preach, you know, people are going to realize, okay, this this is for real. This is serious stuff. If he's taking it seriously, then maybe I should too. Definitely. Anything else? All right, number three. Uh, does this list of qualifications mean that called workers will be perfect and will not fall down in one or more of these areas? <laughs> well, I'm perfect. I don't know about you guys. So. <laughs> no, no, definitely not. Um, you know, there, there's a reason why, you know, the, 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 the lay leaders, the lay members, as well as the called workers are in worship every week. And there's a reason why lay people and called workers confess their sins at the beginning of worship together, because as far as salvation goes, we're all on the same playing field. We are sinful. We deserve God's wrath and punishment. But praise be to God that our sins are washed away by the blood of Jesus and we have received God's grace. So, of course, we're not, as called workers, we're not going to live our lives perfectly um you know uh, there are many times in which you know we're not above reproach um we you know maybe we have the wandering eye to someone who's not our spouse maybe there are times when we lose our lose our temper or maybe we had one too many drinks one night or or you know maybe we we've been greedy for money you know i mean there are, we break these uh standards all the time but um Praise be to God for his grace and that even, you know, God will accomplish his perfect plan even through sinful people like you and I. I mean, all you have to do is look through the pages of the Bible and, and see that's what God has always done. You know, look at what God accomplished through Abraham and, and look at the times where he lied about uh, Sarah being his wife because he didn't trust in the Lord. Think about, you know, Isaac and how God used Isaac, even though Isaac played, uh, showed favoritism amongst his sons. 
and how Jacob was a deceiver. And yet, what, what did God accomplish through Jacob? A whole lot. You think about the flaws of Moses and Moses. Well, yeah, these guys were not uh, husbands of but one wife. No, no, they were not. And yet God still used them and accomplished his, his perfect plan. And God will continue to do that uh, this very day and until the end of time. Um, number four, what is the importance of having called workers set a proper example for the members of the congregation? What is the importance of having called workers set a proper example for the members of the congregation? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, the damage that can be done if um, if a called worker, a public minister, uh, abuses their their trust and, and their office, the, the damage that can be done sometimes is uh, you know, unrepairable. You know, trust is lost. People, um, you know, will have a, a growing distrust of those who serve in the public ministry. Um, significant damage can be done. And so how important it is for the public minister, pastor, teacher, staff minister, what have you, to set the example for the ones that they are, to call, that the, the ones that they're serving. Because, yeah, irre, 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 irreversible damage can happen. Um, how can they be a positive example even when they fall short as a Christian? So again, we've already established the fact that we're, we're not going to do this perfectly. It's called workers. But even then, how can we set a good example? We're going to be in worship. We'll be confessing our sins. We'll be at the Lord's Supper. Um, be asking for forgiveness of the Lord, but also for the brother and giving them the best to others. Mm -hmm. They ask for the most. Yeah. Uh, I'll share a personal example with you guys, and some of you may already be aware of this. Uh, last year, for me personally, it was very rough, and I was in a very, very dark place. And one student in catechism class had made a, a snarky comment about how they didn't complete their homework, and, and I, I flipped out. Um, I, I won't share the details of how I flipped out, but I flipped out. And I, as, as, soon, as, I, as soon as I did what I did, I, I realized, oh boy, I, I, I messed up. <laughs> I, I screwed up big time. Um, and I, I was very concerned that I may, I may lose the, the trust of my students, or I may have done significant damage to, to the reputation of, of this ministry. Um, you know, so the next class period, I, I, I kind of had a, a heart to heart with my students and I apologized and, and, and I was very open to them. I said, you know, this is something that you can learn from this is that even pastors, we're not perfect people. We make mistakes. We find ourselves in, in very dark times in life. Um, we need God's message of grace and peace and forgiveness just as much as anyone else does. Um, and, and they were very appreciative of, of that message. At least I hope they were. I think some of them were for sure, but I don't know about the rest. But anyway, I, I was very transparent with them and, and, and just showing them, yeah, I'm a sinner and I make mistakes and I need forgiveness just like just like you guys. And, and I think we can be open about that as called workers, you know, that, that yes, we're going to make mistakes. And when we do, we'll, we'll ask God for, to forgive us. And, and we pray that you would forgive us as well. So any final comments on that before we move on? All right, let's move on. So, um, Let's, let's talk about how does our church body, the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod, how do we train our called workers? And of course, we are talking mostly about pastors, teachers, staff, ministers, okay? So um, for pastors, how do we do that? Um, we send all of our, all, all students who, who want to pursue the public ministry out of high school, which, uh, which is most common, of course, there are other ways, but this is the most common. Out of high school, students will enroll in our Synod's College 
with that trains future called workers. Martin Luther College in a little little town called New Ulm, Minnesota, um, a little German town. It's very, very German. There's a big statue called Herman the German. Um, I believe it's actually the second largest uh, statue of that kind, uh, right behind the Statue of Liberty. So it's a little factoid you weren't aware about. If you knew Herman the German, well, now you know him real well. But anyway, uh, for pastors, they will um, they will uh, enroll for at least four years at Martin Luther College, studying the Bible, of course, church history. They will learn the basics of uh, the Greek and Hebrew language so that they are able to translate the Old and New Testament in the original language to, to so that they have a better understanding of what the text actually says and not just take for granted that, oh, yes, this English translation, it must be right, because some English translations are better than others. So it's important that our pastors know um, the Greek and Hebrew. Um, and then after they graduate from Martin Luther College, they will enroll it with an, uh, for another four years of education at Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary in Mequon. Um, two years of classroom instruction on campus. Again, more, more uh, depth, in-depth study of God's word and, and uh, practical uh, pastoral education classes, such as how to counsel, how to preach sermon, um, you know, more doctrine classes. The third year will be spent off campus. That's called the vicar year, uh, where for a full calendar year, the, the vicar is training under a full-time pastor. And they get that full year of experience in the parish ministry. So they will practice preaching and teaching and administering to people in their homes and in hospital beds and on their deathbeds. Um, very practical, real life ministry experience. After the vicar year, they come back for one more year of classroom education. That's where we write our senior thesis. And then, um, Lord willing, if uh, you know you complete uh, what is required of you, you will graduate and and receive a call into the full time public ministry. Uh, for teachers, um, again, every out of high school they go to Martin Luther College. Uh, for most most of the time, it's four years. Uh, in some instances, five years of education before they receive their bachelor's of science and education degree and. Um, um, they may or may not uh, receive a call, depending on you know uh, how bit, how things went through through college, you know how student teaching went, um, or you know depending on their future plans, you know if they're going to get married, or are they going to travel abroad, things like that. So, um, but many of them do receive calls into the public ministry. Staff ministers again four years at Martin Luther College under the uh, the, the staff ministry program. And uh, on call day, they, they receive a call where they are assigned to a congregation. Um, for those of you who aren't really aware of what a staff minister does, um, they, they kind of do, they, they, they kind of fill in, you know. Uh, and I know that that's probably underselling it. I, I mean, I've, I haven't had a lot of experience with staff ministers, but I know that they, 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 they teach catechism or they, you know, they, they will sometimes teach classroom. They will, you know, visit shut-ins. Um, you know, if the pastor's gone, they can preach a sermon uh, to fill in every now and again, uh, assist in, in public worship. So, um, again, it, really, the, a staff minister can be just about whatever you want it to be. Um, the congregation sets the, the, the scope of what that ministry is going to look like. Um, let's see. I think that just about explains it. Um Part-time, occasional, or informally called workers, um, you know, I think we kind of covered that a little bit. You know, sometimes pastors can take on part-time calls. Even teachers can take on part-time calls, uh, maybe on an interim basis um, or a trial run before a full-time call is issued. Um, so, or sometimes emergency calls happen where uh a school has been calling for a teacher, but none ha have come to accept the call. So then in, the, in an emergency case, uh, a student from Martin Luther College, preferably a senior, will come and, and, and fill in for on a, on a just that one year basis before they return to school. Um, let's go to uh, number five. Why does our synod have such a rigorous and thorough training system for our called workers? And it is safe to say that uh, our, our synod, our church body, definitely has one of, if not the most, 
rigorous training system for called workers. And that's no exaggeration. It is the truth. Um, why? Pretty sure that what they're teaching follows God's word and they are able to set the example of what they're teaching. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, when it comes to the word of God, we, we can't take shortcuts. Uh, our called workers need to be trained in what God's word says so that they can share that true message to the people that they are called to serve. Because there's a lot of garbage out there. There are a lot of false teachers out there. There are a lot of church bodies that, that even with good intentions, teach false doctrine. And of course, you have those active deceivers. I listed a few of those in the sermon yesterday. Benny Hinn, Kenneth Copeland, those guys are garbage. They're preaching. A, they're not preaching God's word in the slightest. They're not preaching the same Jesus that, that's in the Bible. So, and yet a lot of people fall for that crap. A lot of people fall for that garbage. So how important it is that, that we train our called workers to know what God's word says thoroughly, that the truth can be shared, more people led to heaven, and that we can keep ourselves safe from false doctrine. Beyond what we're taught in a classroom, I think of what goes on in the dorms, and things where I know some people I was first in college with didn't make it all the way through the four years. Mm -hmm. And it maybe wasn't necessarily the classroom work, but rather they went downtown and had a few too many mm -hmm. too often. Yeah. They sneak in and skip chapel. Yeah. Uh, maybe skip classes, those types of things. Mm -hmm. And then they were now still leaving on the back. Right. And yep. I'm still a slight spot. Right. That they were making. Yeah, and, and that it happens all the time. Happens all the time, certainly. So, yeah, it, it's, um, you know, that that thorough, rigorous system kind of, you know, it's kind of a crude way of saying it, but it kind of weeds out those who just aren't fit for it. I, I, I don't know how else to say it other than that. I mean, they may have the desire, and great, that's awesome, good for them that they have a desire to do it, but that doesn't mean that everyone is fit to do it. There's a lot of questions out there, especially from for the teacher's end of it, and you want to make sure that you have a consistent and precise answers. <laughs> yeah, because there's, there's a lot of questions out there. Uh, lots of different questions, lots of different viewpoints, and uh, how important it is that uh, someone is, is, is prepared to you know, speak the truth. Um, scripture tells us to always be prepared to... Give a reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. And our rigorous system certainly equips our called workers to do just that. Uh, what are? Let's go to the next question. I believe that's uh, number six. What are some uh, special aspects of training that you believe are very important? What do you mean by that? Uh, My experience with fire and EMS school upgrade is a lot simpler to look at a problem and solve it with mm -hmm. But when lives are involved and the situations are real, it teaches you more of the value of what you learn to do. Okay. Yeah. R yeah. Real world situations. But it, it's more than that. It's more than just real world experiences. It, it's it has it's real world experiences that have eternal ramifications. You know, it, it's one thing if you mess up in a job and the results, you know, or the ramifications are just temporal. Oh, I messed up on that project. I got to redo it. Okay, it is what it is. Not a big deal. Or or even you know you make a mistake on this project and it costs your company your company millions of dollars. Okay, yeah, bigger deal but still temporal. But when we're talking about eternity here, that's just not something you want to mess with or take lightly. It's, it's mysterious. Talk about eternal life in heaven or eternal damnation in hell. Got to take this stuff seriously. Are any other, any other special aspects of training that you believe are important? The group study, I would think, has got to be good to get different viewpoints. Can you clarify? Well, when you're in your when you're in these classrooms and stuff, and you've got all other people around in the studies when you're studying uh, the four years at uh, Martin Luther College and stuff like that, 
you know, you're talking about you get other people who've come from different backgrounds and now you're all there being taught the same thing, but everybody's got different viewpoints and you got more debates. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, I mean, ha having that, having that benefit of, you know, being together with like-minded Christians um, and, 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 you know, being taught the same thing and yeah, you know, other people are going to have different viewpoints and things like that. And, and, and to a certain extent, you know, it's okay for people to have different views on things, I guess, you know, that are maybe outside of scripture, like how to, how to conduct a ministry, how to teach a classroom, so on and so forth. Um, different people bring different things to the table. That's what makes the body of Christ, the body of Christ. Um, I mean, if we were all, you know, cookie cutter, exactly the same, you know, maybe, maybe we'd have great strength in one area, but a total big weakness in the other. So, I mean, we can't all be the same. But we all need to be taught the same thing, and that is the, the true word of God. Um, and another another important blessing, uh, you know, our church body, you know, is small compared to other church bodies. But a benefit from that is that we know that all of our pastors, teachers, staff ministers are being taught the same true word of God. Um, you know, larger church bodies that have, you know, multiple colleges, seminaries, you know, maybe one seminary has a conservative agenda. Maybe one seminary has a more liberal agenda. Uh, that's something that the Missouri Synod ha has battled for decades, you know, with their, their campuses in Fort Wayne, Indiana and, and St. Louis, Missouri. Um, you don't know what you're always going to get in a Missouri Synod church. But you can almost guarantee you know what you're going to get when you come to a Wisconsin Synod Church in school. So there are some blessings to being not too big. That's why, you know, I don't see us ever, you know, a lot of people ask, well, why don't why doesn't Wells and ELS just form one bigger church body? Well, I don't I don't see a ne uh, necessity to do that. We bring different stuff to the table. And besides, like if we got too big, uh, you know, maybe I'd get complicated of course we want more people to to, to come into our churches and, and hear the gospel we definitely want that um, we don't want to shrink to the point where we where we become non-existent but you know if we got too big you know like you know maybe missouri sin inside they're all there i think a million plus um you know maybe there's something to be said about you know breaking off into a you know a sister church body or something i don't that's just me thinking out loud there but i think you get the point all right let's move on so how does someone become a called minister? Um, while, there, while there are times in the past that God had called individuals directly into the public ministry, that's what we call um, immediate. Like, you know, for example, God directly called people like Moses, the prophet Jeremiah and Ezekiel, Isaiah, um, you know, to, to, to public ministry. Jesus directly called the disciples jesus directly <laughs> appeared to saul who became paul on the road to damascus um you know that's how god had done that in the past but in current times we see that god calls people indirectly or immediately through his church here on earth uh, for, for an example the, the seven deacons they were called by the church to assist with the ministry in jerusalem and around judea um, the apostles, they they were the ones responsible for casting the lots to call the 12th apostle, Matthias, who would replace Judas. And um, then, of course, you have Paul and Barnabas. They were called by the, the, the first Christians to go and do missionary work. So that's how that's how it's done today, where God calls people into the ministry through other people in his church here on earth. So um, in the church in Jerusalem, God called people to serve through his believers in the church. Um, here we see um, kind of what I alluded to earlier, where uh, the church on earth called Matthias to be the 12th apostle. Could, could someone read that, please? Go ahead, Miriam. Here's that is necessary to choose one of the men who have been the whole time in the Lord Jesus Christ and all among us. But one of these must be completely of his resurrection. So they proposed two men, Joseph, Paul, Barnabas, called Paul, Justice, and Matthias. 
Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry. Which Judas left to go over to the people. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Messiah. So he was added to the eleven apostles. Okay. So God worked through the church here on earth to call the 12th apostle Matthias. Um, the, the church in Jerusalem also established the, the qualifications. So kind of, uh, you know, going back to, to that reading, you know, it's necessary that, that this person would, be, would uh, have been with us the whole time when Jesus was out and about with us. Um, this person must be a witness uh, who has seen the resurrected Jesus. So they 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 set the parameters. They they set the standards. Um, the church proposed a number of candidate candidates. Uh, I believe uh, was it uh, uh, Justice and uh, and uh, or Barsabas, also called Justice, and then Matthias. So they came they came up with the candidates. Um, the the church prayed for guidance and trust. And uh, then they eventually, through the casting of lots or voting, uh, they decided to call Matthias to be the 12th apostle. So you kind of see that system in place there. <clears throat> uh, today, God continues to extend calls to individuals uh, into the church through fallible and flawed human beings. You and me, the church. Um, God uses us to call people into the public ministry. Responsibility for, for calling belongs to the church. Uh, the church may you know, choose to delegate that responsibility to maybe a smaller group, like a voters assembly or a board of education. Uh, real life example for, for me personally, um, I was blessed in Tacoma to be on the board of directors for Evergreen Lutheran High School. And uh, for months, we were trying to call a principal. So instead of the entire Evergreen Association, which consists of congregations throughout the entire state of Washington and Oregon and Idaho, you know, like you, you, you can't, there's no way that that's not an efficient way to have all these people from multiple states, you know, call someone to serve at Evergreen Lutheran High School in Tacoma. So they entrusted to the board of directors to issue calls for them. Okay. So, that, and that's how that works in, in situations like, Area Lutheran high schools and our, our, and colleges, you know, MLC, WLC, Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary, um, and I believe even the the, the worker prep schools, uh, Luther Prep and Michigan Lutheran Seminary, um, and I believe uh, uh, you know uh, um, that's kind of how that works at, at uh, Synod headquarters. You know, when a position needs to be filled uh, at Synod leadership, that's kind of how they do that as well. Um, despite the involvement of human beings and human judgments, the call in every way is a divine call, a call from God. So God, again, uses us, sinful human beings though we may, to continue his public ministry here on earth. Um, next question, number seven. Is there any difference between calls that God made immediately and those that are made immediately? Is there any difference? No, because it's still God calling you. Yeah. The execution. Right. The, the execution is very different. And I mean, you could say, yeah, there are differences. God is doing it, you know, directly to Moses, to Elijah, to the apostles. Um, God doesn't do that today. Uh, but nonetheless, that does not change the uh, the effectiveness of the call or or the legitimacy of the call. Definitely. Um, going on to number eight, how was calling uh, how was calling done by the church in Jerusalem similar to how we do it today? Okay. They came up with their candidates, they realized the parameters needed, they voted on it, asked lots. They prayed. prayed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If there's one thing that, one takeaway that I remember uh, very well from being in those call meetings at Evergreen there was tons of prayer like before, before you know when the meeting started prayer before we looked at the list of candidates prayer after we you know before we narrowed down the candidates prayer and then once we narrowed the list of like six or seven down to like the top two or three then we prayed for for blessing on our discussion 
And then we prayed that God would lead us to call that individual. And then we prayed that God would lead this person to, to make the right decision for his kingdom. You know, seven times, seven plus times, or, or around seven times. What? What? <laughs> wow. I'm, I'm just glad that the people at home aren't able, that weren't able to see that. I was, I was saying seven times and I'm holding up six fingers. It's been a long day, folks. What can I say? I'm doing this in front of teachers. I don't know. Maybe, Ken, maybe you do need to be my teacher again. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I need to go back to Mrs. Anderson's classroom. Who knows? <laughs> anyway, uh, but you get the point. Uh, around seven or eight times for one call, prayer was done. You know, so, I mean, that, that was one of the biggest takeaways that I had being part of the calling process. Um, and, and, yeah, it, it was very similar. You know, we have, you know, this is what we want this person that we're calling. We want them to do this, 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 and that. This is what we expect of them. And then, you know, we, we, we have a list compiled, given to us by our church body. And we pray and discuss and pray and decide and pray and discuss and pray and decide. Um and then, yeah, that's that. so there is a lot of similarities, similarities to it. Um, you know, how is it different? Well, um, well you don't come up with, yeah, our own congregation doesn't come up with right. We have to, to give us names of eligible. Right. We are asking for someone who's outside of our congregation to bring us a list of people that we think would, would serve best. And, and, and we'll talk more about this as we continue on in this study. But our church leadership, our leaders in our in our, our synod, they do a really good job in, in listening to what our needs and desires are and then bringing us a list of people that they feel would fit those parameters very well. So they do a really good job with that. And man, uh, the, you know, district presidents that uh, and I kind of talked about how that how the, 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 the 12 districts work last week so if you didn't catch that conversation you can go back in last week's bible study and listen in on that but the, the work that district presidents do considering you know how many calls are issued and and sent it sent back and accepted i mean there's a lot of work that goes into that so just offer up a prayer of thanksgiving for the work that our district presidents do it's incredible uh number nine what are ways in which human sinfulness and weakness might insert themselves into the issuing of a call What are ways in which sin, human sinfulness and weakness might insert themselves into the issuing of a call? Maybe somebody goes, somebody on the like, yeah, <laughs> right, yes, yes, absolutely. I, I, I've had that thought, you know, um, you know, like let, let's say, you know, one of these days, you know, one of our teachers either retires or, or accepts a call elsewhere, and we got to fill this vacancy. You know, having gone through, you know, to, through Martin Luther College I, 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 and, and being associated with people in the ministry and, and, you know, people talk. And so, you know, I have opinions about certain people like, you know, the church, you know, that, oh, oh, this person's on that list. Oh, they were they were a jerk in college. Ugh. Well, I, I don't want them anywhere near here. I, I don't like that person. You know, so I'm going to try to influence the congregation to maybe these other six candidates and leave that seventh guy. Forget about him. You know, that can happen. Or, oh, that's my best bud. I, I want to work with my bud. Oh, man, that, that'll be that'll be so awesome. It'll be so much fun. He's a great guy. My former congregation, we were issuing a call, and I knew one of the candidates on her from the college days, mm -hmm. and that person was African-American. Not that it matters to me, mm -hmm. But I brought that up to the voters, even. and then it was nice to hear that no, it doesn't matter. But I, I didn't want that to suddenly be a surprise that that person got the call came and uh, yeah, it, it shouldn't. It shouldn't make it. It shouldn't, right? But uh, yeah, I mean, again, we're the only like, we're, we're right. Yeah, that we're predom we're predominantly white. There's no getting around that, and. You know, we are still dealing with sinful people who may have some uh, antiquated thoughts about race. Yeah, but it shouldn't matter. But yeah, that that can affect things too, unfortunately. Uh, but even when that happens, what can we still be certain of? Right, exactly. And God has done this for forever. 
<laughs> he has even where he's worked around our weaknesses and mistakes and still his will is going to be done. Right. So it's just incredible how God works. All right, let's, uh, let's move on. I'm going to try to wrap this up, uh, get through the, the rest of this uh, sheet here today. So how does the Wells call process work? Going to be doing some reading uh, from, from my little teacher's guide here. So here we go. So God has not mandated a specific process for the church to call people to serve in the public ministry. So various Christian churches, they use different processes, and there's nothing inherently wrong with that. The process that Wells has put into place is not a, is not divinely mandated, but rather it's a process that we in Christian freedom have agreed to use for the sake of good order and for the benefit of the church. And there are several different ways in which the call process is used in our synod. So when men and women uh, graduate from Martin Luther College, um, or when men graduate from Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary, or even when they begin their vicar year, because even the vicar year is a form of public ministry in our church body, um, their calls come to them through the assignment process. So um, they are assigned, they, they, they have a governing body of, you know, um, you know, like maybe the board of directors for uh, for for Martin Luther College or Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary, as well as the the synod leadership, synod president, vice president, um, and then the twelve district presidents. They they uh, they they have the list of candidates who are who uh, would like to receive calls into the public ministry. They assess you know um, reports from their teachers, their professors their strengths and weaknesses and try to match them up where they feel they would best serve. Um, let's see here. Uh, calls to uh, synodical or district positions are done by elections, either by full-time or part-time uh, their positions are. Um, same thing with uh, synodical schools, administrative positions. Um, they can be done through election processes um, um, done by, you know, board of directors, things like that. But uh, going back to, you know, those who are assigned out of college, you know, but people who graduate from our, our, our college or seminary by presenting themselves, uh, these, these young people, they are saying that they are willing to go wherever God sends them. OK, that's an important thing that they, they're not they don't have a you know, I want to go here. I want to go there. Um, when a person presents themselves for a call, they're saying, here, my Lord, send me. I don't care where. So then you have the special committee called the assignment committee. It's, it's composed of the 12 district presidents, synod presidents, and vice presidents, um, as well as the presidents of the four synodical schools, uh, school personnel, and Wells administrator to serve as advisors to the assignment committee. Um, sorry, I'm going to go back because I realized I got a little ahead of myself there. Still talking about the assignment of candidates. So congregations submit their requests for called workers to the district presidents. They inform the district president of the scope of the call and of any specific or special skills and abilities that might be needed. The district presidents then bring these requests to the assignment committee. The assignment committee considers these requests one by one and strives to find candidates who best fit the needs of the call. The district president makes a notion to assign a candidate to a given place and the entire assignment committee votes on each assignment. Candidates have expressed a willingness to go wherever they are assigned, but there are exceptions to that general rule. Candidates assigned to a foreign mission or to Canada or to Alaska are given the right to decline such a call because of the special demands and hardships required. So in other words, before individuals are assigned to, you know, foreign missions or, you know, somewhere very, very far away, they're given a heads up like, hey, we're thinking about sending you to Africa. Or hey, we're thinking about sending you to, um, you know, you know, Alaska, uh, or or northern Canada, or whatever. Um, you know, can you think about it and, and let us know whether you not you want to go there? Because I mean, that's that's more that's more of a complicated thing than just going to the lower forty eight states. Um. So if a candidate declines such a call, he or she is assigned to another place of service. Some assignments are for a limited time, usually one year. Some reasons for one-year calls are like either the candidate is assigned 
to hit to a position for which he or she is not specifically trained, such as a teacher whose gifts indicate that he or she would be best suited to teach lower grades, but then is assigned to teach upper grades. Or candidates are assigned to dormitory supervisors for one year, thus uh, delaying their service in a congregation or classroom. Uh, female teachers who plan to marry within a year or two, or maybe a situation in the congregation does not know whether the worker will be needed beyond one year. Uh, the candidate then returns to the assignment committee when that time has been completed. All right, now we get to the uh, calls to synodical or district positions. Calls to synod and district positions are issued through an election process at synod or district conventions. A person elected to such a position is called to the position for a set term by means of the election. Professors at synodical schools are called by the governing boards of the school. At Martin Luther College or Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary, nominations for these positions are made by the voting members of the synod. Okay, um, so yeah, I, I often get emails um, from Wells saying, all right, we're looking for a candidate for a professor of Greek at Martin Luther College. So put it, give us a name and, and give us a candidate and, and, and we'll compile it and, and we'll you know, make the call. Um, calls to synodical administrative positions are issued by the various synodical groups that oversee them, such as Conference of Presidents, Board for World Missions, Board of Home Missions, et cetera. Um, so number 10, question for you. In Wells, there are different ways in which calls are extended. There are also different groups who extend those calls. How do these various ways of doing things illustrate the saying that God calls the workers, but he gives the church the freedom to decide how that is carried out? Or, or, or if you want to answer the second question, could we decide to carry out the call process in a different way? I think we certainly could do it a different way. Mm -hmm. Um, this works well for us for I don't know how long this has been working. Mm -hmm. Over 100 years, I would assume. Probably, yeah. But yeah, certainly we could come up with something different as long as it's God pleasing and yeah. God pleasing God calling the person. Yeah. And I think a lot of uh, a lot of different church bodies kind of do it in a more secular way. Um, or or they'll give someone like a trial run. Like, okay, we're looking for a new pastor. So we have these lists, these pastors have applied. Let's invite them to preach. And, you know, if we like what they do, then, then we'll issue a call to them. Um, that's fine. But I think it brings in a lot of the human element into the decision-making process. Where I think it, with our system, it, 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 I mean, you, you can't avoid having the human element involved. You, you can't avoid it. But at least with this way, it keeps the human element to a minimum and, and keeps emotion out of it as, as best as it can. So uh, let's see. I, I'll try to get done in five minutes here because we, we're at about an hour now due to the technical difficulties that we were having. All right. Uh, the call process to congregations. Um. I think we, we, we're kind of familiar with that. Um, the district president, again, of course, they, they compile this congregation, tells district president, okay, we need someone who fits these qualifications, compile for us a list. And, and, and we as called workers, one thing we're asked to do on a yearly basis to update our um, bi synod biography, if you will, update our strengths, our weaknesses, what we've done in ministry, what we'd like to do in ministry, even some of our dislikes. What are, you know, what are my weaknesses? What are things I'm not good at? And that kind of helps the district presidents figure out, okay, this person would be a good candidate here, but this person would not be. So I'm not going to put this person on the call list, but I'll put this person on the call list for this specific congregation. Um, all right. The call process for congregations, like I said, uh, we, we already went through that. Uh, the vacancy occurs. Um, whether it be death or retirement or a person goes somewhere else or a new position is created, congregation calls dish president, congregation evaluates the needs and plans, congregation meets with the district president to share those needs, district president takes information provided by the congregation and researches for candidates who meet the congregation's needs and who are eligible for a call, 
a call meeting is scheduled in which the district president or his designee, maybe it's a circuit pastor or a district vice president, then they present the list to the can the list of candidates to the congregation. Uh, district president will provide biographical and personal information, including the person's strengths, weaknesses, interests of each candidate. The calling body. Um, usually the voters assembly will discuss each candidate and they will vote. And once votes are identify the person called, then the motion is made to call the person unanimously. And it has to be done that way unanimously because, you know, we all have to be on board and say, yes, this is the person that we are going to call. Otherwise, if it's not done unanimously, um, yeah, that's, <laughs> that doesn't work out too well in, in your favor. The call process for congregation is not a hiring process. Kind of talked about that already. Um, let's see here. Let's skip ahead a bit to let's skip ahead to, to the last question, number 14. Uh, there, there is some variation in the amount of biographical information that each district president provides. Why is it not a bad thing that this may vary from district to district? So some, some information might be provided about a candidate to, to one district or one congregation, and maybe some of that information is withheld. Why, why or why, why is this not a bad thing? I have it in my head, but I think out the words. Um, he, you know, like, it's just not pertinent, and it's, you know, it's not, it's not going to affect the call in the direction. So it's at that point of new, new knowledge. Right. I would think of it in a situation like ours, where our children are grown out of house, does it matter that I have five boys? Mm hmm. If they're all well married. Yeah, right, they yeah. They are. It's not, it's not perfect to, mm -hmm. to get all right. Right, if you, yeah, if, if that's developed, that's really perfect. Right, exactly. However, if we had a situation by the congregation where we called somebody, assuming they were just a single lady and enough she had children, that made a difference as to where they're going to be housed or their insurance. And mm -hmm. that was difficult. Right for the congregation to deal with. I don't know if it was intentionally withheld or accidentally off the record. I, I don't know, but it ended up being a big deal. Yeah, and I think and and to add to that, um, I believe it is also the responsibility of the calling body to assist a little bit in uh, you know uh, finding housing, not necessarily providing it per se, but like. Like, okay, here's what we have, you know, okay, you're you're a single gal, you know, you're probably in the market for just a, you know, a one bedroom apartment, you know, so uh, here, here's, here's some options. We're not going to pick for you, but, you know, we'll assist you and we'll kind of give you an idea of what's available in the area. Um, you you kind of do need that information. But in a situation like that, if that were to happen again, I think it just goes to show that even our calling process, as wonderful as it has worked, is not perfect. And I don't think there is a perfect system other than God directly going to you and say, I want you to go here at such and such a time. And that's what's going to be. <laughs> that's the only perfect calling process. Um, you know, our calling process does have flaws, as everyone does. But uh, we, I, I do believe that this is what, what is best for our church body. So that's, what, that's where we'll end things today, unless anybody else has any other comments, questions, concerns, complaints.